Hi everyone, in this video we'll explore how to use threads to boost our game's performance, load assets smoothly without causing frame drops, and cover important aspects of multi-threading like race conditions, deadlocks, and synchronization. Now to begin with, I want to showcase how threads can be useful in our games. So I prepared this scene in which I have a button which allows me to start loading these two loading bars. Now what I want to do is to use multi-threading for our second loading bar to make it load twice as fast. Now let's see how we can do that. I have here a script for the simple loading bar, which basically just creates this progress bar and sets a maximum value to it. And what we do is we just pretend that this loading bar is loading. And how do we pretend? Well, from zero to the maximum value, we add one to the progress bar and then we wait for 0.03 seconds. And finally, we have this on button press function. So whenever we press the button, we pretend that we will load until 100%. Now, the code for the other progress bar is basically identical, and if we, for example, run our project now, if I press start loading, you see that our progress bars load at the same rate. Now, we want to create a thread, but first of all, what even is a thread? Well, a thread is basically just a separate execution flow that runs alongside the main flow. It's like a mini program that we can run in parallel with our main program. Now, in Godot, if we want to create a new thread, we're simply going to have to create a new variable. So var thread of type thread. This variable has to be initialized. So in my ready function, I'm just going to say thread equals to thread dot new. Now that the thread is initialized, what we can do is call any function we want with this thread. So as you remember, we have here on button pressed, pretend you are loading for 100. What if instead of loading everything on the main thread, we load half of the data on the main thread and the other half on the second thread? How would we do that? Well, first of all, I pretend I am loading for 50 and I want to also pretend that I'm loading on my thread. So in order to call any function on my thread, I'm just going to have to write thread.start and here I have to write this callable and the callable is going to be pretend you are loading, to which we want to basically bind this value of 50. So now we have two threads loading our data. First one is the main thread, and the second one is this other thread that we just created. Now, if I press F5, you'll see that if I start loading, the second progress bar will load twice as fast as the first progress bar. Now, a few things we should keep in mind is, first of all, we have some issues here in the debugger. And the main issue is that we are trying to interact with something in the scene tree directly from a thread. And that's generally not thread safe. And we should use call deferred in this case. So our update progress bar of one should maybe be replaced with call deferred of update progress bar and one. Okay, and maybe let's make this a string. Okay, now that we call this in a deferred way, you'll see that our errors are going to vanish. Now, finally, one other thing that we have to do is to also wait for the thread to finish because we don't want to exit our tree without having everything finished its execution. So what we are going to do is to just write func exit tree and whenever we exit the tree, we just wait for the thread to finish. So basically just write thread dot wait to finish. And this is going to wait for the thread to finish as well. If I save, now the program is correct and runs the same way as before. Now, one other small detail that you might have noticed is that we could have made the simple variant without threads go as fast as this current variant. So. If you see in this example, I could, instead of pretending that I'm loading for 100, just pretend that I'm loading for 50 and again for 50. Now, if I run this right now, surprisingly, they're going to have the same speed. Now, why does that happen? This happens because when we created our pretend function, in order to pretend, we awaited for some time by using the await keyword inside function, we basically made this function a coroutine. Now, generally for a coroutine, 
you have to await because if you do not await, it is going to be run in parallel with whatever comes next. So because we awaited, these two functions are going to be run in parallel. If we wanted to actually simulate, let's say an example in which uh, our code did not await for anything but lasted 0.03 seconds, then we would have to also add await here and await here. Now these coroutines are behaving just like functions that would take 0.03 seconds to finish. And if I start, you'll see that it is now working properly. The simple variant is still slower than the multi-threaded variant. If you want to learn more about coroutines, I'll attach a video in the description. Now for the next example, I want to load a huge image to my scene. So as you can see, I have a character body 2D, which is going to simply be moving. And I have a sprite, which is going to load this huge squirrel image. You see, it's almost a 4K image, so it's pretty big. So it might introduce some lag to our game. And if I actually run this, you'll see that I can move normally. And if I press space, there was a kind of a frame freeze there. I'm going to do it again, just so it's more noticeable. But if I press now space, I'm going to load the image and you saw I got a little bit of a freeze there and we do not want our game to freeze. Now, how is this image loaded? Well, this image is indeed loaded with the resource loader load function. Now, you could argue that we could have used preload and I perfectly agree. If we use preload, you'll see that after I press space, there's no frame drop. However, when using preload, we can only preload paths that we actually know. If, for example, we were to have some variable paths, so var path equals to res and plus something, then we can no longer use this preload. So we are stuck with these frame drop issues. Okay, but let's just go back to our resource loader. And just as before, we load the image with this function. Now, how can we load this image without interrupting the main functionality, which was moving our character around, so without having that frame drop? Well, a solution would be to create a separate thread on which to load this texture. Okay, so let's create a new thread. Let's call it var thread equals to thread dot new. And we want to load these resources by using this new thread. So. We do just as before, we're going to say thread.start and let's just make a new function. Let's maybe call it func bg load. And in this bg load function, we want to basically do the same thing. We want to separately load this texture and also set the texture. Now, also, we might not want to start the thread again and again whenever we press space, so we could check if our thread is currently alive. So if thread dot is alive, then we want to do nothing. So I'm just going to simply return. Okay, so if our thread is alive, we do nothing. If it's not alive, we start it with our bg load callable. Now, if I press save and if I press F5, you'll see that I move around and when I press space, the image loaded without any lag. And if you think that was a coincidence, let's try again. If I move, if I press space, again, no lag, I just loaded the image. Now, one thing you might want would be to pass this whole loading of a texture to the main thread. And if you want to do that, you could also make here a new function. So maybe func uh, load done. And what this function would do would basically be to store this texture that we return from our thread. So instead of setting the texture to text, we are simply going to return this new texture. And what I'm going to do here is say var new text, for example, equals to thread dot wait to finish. See, we can wait to finish our thread and our thread will return whatever this function we called returns instead. So in this case, thread dot wait to finish will return the loaded texture. And of course we can afterwards say set texture to be this new text. Now, of course, this load done is never called, but we could call it at any moment in our main function, or we could 
even call it in a deferred way from our thread. So we could say something like call deferred and here just say load done. So now we basically loaded this texture, we returned it and we passed the texture applying to our main thread. So if I press F5, you'll see that I can move around and if I press space, basically the same thing happens. Now, if threads are so great, why don't we use them for more cases? Why don't we make all games faster by using threads? Well, this happens because threads also come with some caveats. First of all, there is such a thing as a race condition. We don't really know how the threads are scheduled. Some threads could start sooner, some threads could uh, stop and give priority to other threads. We don't really have control over that. And even for a simple example such as this, where we simply assign to x, x plus 1, we could have some issues. Now, let's try to analyze what happens in that code. First of all, what do we mean when we say x equals to x plus 1? Well, what we want to do is to get the current value of x, which could be, let's say, 5, and we want to set now to x the value of 5 plus 1. So we now want to set 6, right? So, in a normal case, we have our main thread, which creates this first thread and also creates this second thread. Now, the first thread is trying to get this x. So as you can see, it's trying to get x and the value of x is actually 5. So when trying to set this new x value, it's going to set it to 5 plus 1. So here we are going to have the value of 6. Now the second thread can join in and we'll try to get the x value as well. So by getting this value, it gets 6, and then it sets the value to x equal x plus 1, which will be 7. Everything is normal right now. But what if we have another example? What if our main function creates the first thread again and creates the second thread, and the first thread gets the x value, which is 5, and of course pulls it so that it can set this value to 5 plus 1, which is 6. But before the first thread manages to set this value to 6, the second thread joins in and tries as well to get the value of x. Now the issue here is that the value that we got here is 5, and the value that our thread is calculating is going to be 6. But now when our second thread joins in, it's going to set the value of x to whatever it found before, so it's going to set it to 5 plus 1, as we have here, and it's going to set it again to 6. So instead of having 7 as we would expect, because thread 1 and thread 2 both acted, we have only 6. So basically our threads were racing to get to our common variable x that we were using, and they tried to use x at the same time, leading to this issue. Now, let us take a look at a more concrete example in which a race condition could happen. Let's say that we have this use magic function. Now, this use magic function just increases the value of x, and if we get to the value of 5, it basically just doubles its value, so x is going to be equal to 10. Now, obviously, if x is 10, we are going to get outside of this while loop, and afterwards we are going to print the value of x, which should be 10. Now, what if after we checked for this x to be 5, we did some other computations? So let's just simulate that with another await. So we do await get 3 dot create timer of 0.1 seconds. Why not? And timeout. So we pretend we do some computations in between. Before, we expected this value to be equal to 10. Let's see what value we actually get after running this function with a thread and with the main thread. If I press F5, you see that I get the value of 20. But why is that? Okay, so as we said, we start with our main thread. Let's call it M. Now, the first thing that happens is that this main thread creates a new thread. So it's going to create on the side this thread T. Now, what's going to happen? Well, this thread is going to 
calls the function useMagic. So basically it enters the while loop. Now at the same time, our main thread is also going to call this useMagic. So it's also going to enter this while loop. Now what happens inside the while loop? Well, let's just say that from here we are in the while loop. At some point in the main thread maybe or in the other thread, we are going to have a value of five for our x. So let's say that here x equals to five. What's gonna happen is that our main loop is going to enter this if. And inside this if, the main thread is going to have to wait for 0.1 seconds or going to have to do something else for 0.1 seconds. So let's say that this is 0.1 seconds in which our main loop does something. Now, in the meantime, the other thread is also inside this loop. And what's happening? Well, if the loop starts again, our current x value is equal to 5. So the first line in the loop is x equals to x plus 1. So this x value here is going to be equal to 6. Now, of course, if x is equal to 6, we don't enter this loop. And we don't enter it for when it's 7, and we don't enter it for when it's 8, and so on. We don't enter this loop ever, actually, on this second thread. So what's going to happen is that x is going to simply get incremented until x reaches the value of 10, at which point this loop is going to simply stop. Now, if we go back to our main loop, let's say that the processing is finally over. The main loop still has one more instruction to execute. And what is that instruction? Well, that instruction was x equals to x times 2. But the issue now is that our x is no longer going to be equal to 5. Because x is a global variable, it has been modified by our other thread, so x is now equal to 10. And the new value that we are going to get on our x is going to be equal to 10 times 2, which is going to be equal to 20. So even if we expected our x to stop at 10, you see how a separate thread because it was racing with our main thread, could have disrupted that and given us this answer. Now, does all this mean that we cannot use threads if they try to access the same variable? Well, no, because we can use a thing called a mutex. Now, in order to explain what a mutex is, you could imagine an empty room. Now, in this room, only one person can go in. Maybe it's a voting booth or maybe it's a place in which people change their clothes or whatever and of course there are a few people waiting which is a good analogy to our multiple threads so you could imagine this red person to be this main thread and this blue person to be our created thread here now what happens is that this uh, booth has here a lock so I'm trying to make <laughs> some kind of lock icon here. Now, if a person goes in, they will lock this door and this other person will have to wait until the person that entered finishes whatever business they had. Afterwards, when the person leaves, they will unlock the booth so then the other person can go in. So in this whole analogy, a mutex is basically that lock is a way to make all other threads stop until one thread finishes whatever business is in that piece of code. Now, as a rule of thumb, it's good to use a mutex whenever multiple threads are modifying or verifying the value of the same variable. So you will see that there are cases in which we can use mutexes and cases in which it doesn't make too much sense to do that. But we'll see in this concrete example. So. If I were to create a mutex, I could simply write var mutex and let's give it a type of mutex and this is going to be equal to mutex.new. Okay, now that we have this lock, we can block a region of code to only be accessible to one thread at a time. So in our first try, we might want to lock this check. So if we reached this point in which x equals 5, we could do something like mutex.lock 
And afterwards, it's very important to also unlock this because otherwise the program will wait forever as no thread is going to be able to advance from that point. So what we have to do is to do mutex dot unlock. So in this region of code, only a single thread at a time can go in, which means that if our main thread goes in this uh, check, it will wait 0.1 seconds. And in the meantime, our other thread will not add its value to X. And now if we run our program, you will see an interesting result. The result is not 10, <laughs> the result is 12. Now, why is that? Well, if we look over our code right now, again, we entered the while with our main thread and we entered the while with our other thread. Let's say that again, in our main thread, we reach this point in which we check for X to be equal to five. So we reach that point and X is actually equal to five and we do that waiting and we want to multiply X by two. Now, in the meantime, our other thread starts the while loop again. And what does it do? Well, after starting the while loop, X equals to X plus one. So if X was equal to five, X will now be equal to six. Now, of course, after this point, the thread is going to wait. Why is it going to wait? Because of the mutex lock that we did here. So the thread waits when X is equal to six. Finally, our main thread finishes whatever work it had, multiplying the value of X by two. But since X was equal to six, then the new X is going to be equal to 12. And obviously the mutex gets unlocked and the mutex gets unlocked here as well. And the loop basically finishes. Now, how could we make this correct then? Well, you could say that we could simply move this mutex lock up, but if we run now, you'll see that the answer is now 11. Now, this is weird again. And why does this happen? Well, again, this is going to get locked when X equals five. We're gonna wait some time and then X will be equal to 10. But our other thread was stuck here in between of the while and the lock. And what happens when this lock is opened? Well, our thread continues its work. And what was its work? Well, it was to add one to the X. And since X was 10, it added one and now it's 11. Okay, so what could we do in this case? Well, we could move up the mutex lock and we could uh, align it with the unlock. And now if we press a five, you see that the result is 10. But well, doing this is kind of useless now if you think about it. Because if we wrap this whole code with a mutex lock and unlock, we are basically saying Okay, thread one has to wait for thread two to finish its whole execution. Then thread two has to wait for thread one to finish its whole execution. So basically what we are doing is to sequentially run the functionality of thread one and thread two. And that is pretty much the same thing as running the program without threads at all. So we might want to find a solution in which we use a lock that does not cover the complete code. And in this case, well, there's not really a good solution because as you can see in this code, everywhere we work with this X, we either check the value of X or we modify the value of X or we check it again or we modify it again. And remember what we said before, whenever we modify a variable or whenever we check the value of a variable, we have to use a lock in order to only do it with one thread. Now, previously we discussed about limiting the access to shared data only to one thread at a time, but there could be cases in which we might be able to allow multiple threads at a time. So a given number of threads. So how could we do that? Well, for that, there is a thing called a semaphore. Now, in order to better visualize what a semaphore is, you can imagine that this is a parking place which has three free empty spots. And yeah, you could think of this parking place as a region of code that we want our threads to access. Now, these five cars are our threads and at the entrance of our region of code, we have a number. We have a semaphore saying three because there are three empty spots. Now, if one thread or one car wants to join a spot, it's simply going to join this spot and this number is going to be decreased to two. 
if another car joins then this number is going to be decreased to one and if a car leaves or a thread finishes its work then of course this number is going to be increased again to two now what happens if two more cars join well if two more cars join then this number at the entrance of the parking place is going to be zero and this means that our semaphore is not going to allow any more cars to join until there is a free spot in our parking place. So basically, no other threads can access this region of code before either of these three threads finishes its work. Now, in order to showcase how this works, I created three card threads and also I created a semaphore. Now, this semaphore is going to tell us how many empty places there are in our parking spot. And let's say that we want to have two empty places. Now we'll see how to implement that soon. But what we want to do with each car, we want to say, okay, the car is parking. Then the car waits for some time. So for example, runs this while loop and afterwards it's going to leave the parking spot. Okay. But first of all, how do we say that the semaphore allows two places? Well, there is sadly no direct way of initializing a semaphore to two because Godot by default initializes a semaphore to zero. However, we could increase the number of allowed threads by using post. So if I write semaphore.post, this is going to basically raise the number from zero to one and basically one thread can go through. If I write post again, then two threads can go through. Now in our printif allowed, we want to specify that a car has parked so that a place in our parking spot is busy. In order to do that, we have to lower the semaphore number. So what are we going to do is to write semaphore.wait. With semaphore.wait, if the number was, let's say, before this is going to change to one if the number was one it's going to change to zero and if the number is zero the current thread is simply going to wait okay and now if we want to leave the parking spot we have to raise that number again and to raise the number we simply write again semaphore.post now if i run it right now you'll see that first of all two of these cars are going to enter our parking spot and only after some time, the third car will join in. So if I press F5, you'll see that one and two is parking. And at some point, one of them left the parking spot and three was parking. Maybe it would be good to specify also which one uh, was leaving. So let's try running again. So one, two is parking, one is leaving parking spot, three is parking, two is leaving, and three is leaving. If I were to limit this semaphore initially to only have one empty place, then something different would happen. One is parking, one is leaving, two is parking, two is leaving, three is parking, three is leaving. And of course, if I had three empty places, so I post it three times, you'll see that all of them are parking at the same time, and all of them are leaving at the same time. Oh, and one thing that I forgot to mention is that if we initialize a semaphore to one, it will behave exactly like a mutex. So basically it will only allow one thread at a time. Now, one very important thing to consider when multi-threading is deadlocks. Deadlocks occur when two or more threads in a program get stuck and each of them then wait for the other one to release the resource. Now, for example, I have here two threads and two mutexes and each thread calls its own function. I have here th1 and here th2 and basically what both functions do is that they lock one mutex and then they lock another mutex and the other function does exactly the same but in reverse. So instead of locking mutex1 it locks mutex2 and locks mutex1. Now you might see here these lines of code but uh, I added this here just to make some artificial delay between my threads so that I have a higher chance of getting a bad result. Now, let's see what we actually have here. Ideally, thread one will work like this. It will lock mutex number one. Then after some work, it will lock mutex number two. And finally, when everything is finished, it unlocks mutex two and unlocks mutex one. 
Now, the same thing happens here, but in reverse. So the second thread function is going to lock mutex number two, lock mutex number one, and then unlock mutex number one and mutex number two. Okay, but now our main issue is that the thread one could be locking mutex number one. Thread two at the same time could be locking mutex number two. Now, if both of these mutexes are locked, then we reach the following problem. If we get to line 24 on our first thread, we can't continue because mutex number two was previously locked by thread two. So then our only hope is that we can get out from the th2 function. But we also can't get out from here because if we reach line 34 here, the mutex number one was previously locked by th1. So again, we are stuck here. So basically both of these threads are stuck at these points. And because they are stuck, they will never move forward to execute the rest of the code. Now, if I run, you'll see that I get the following two messages. Thread one locked mutex one, so this first one, and thread two locked mutex two, so this second one. However, I'm not getting any of these two messages, and I'm not getting them because this part of the code is never reached. That's why we must be very careful when we lock and unlock mutexes to make sure that we don't create such issues. Now, one other example of a bad thing that could happen would be a function that breaks. So for example, if th1, let's say, had some issues and returned at this point, the problem is that the mutex gets locked, but the issue makes the function return. And so the mutex never gets unlocked again, which will eventually block the thread number two. And as you can see, Thread number two never got to print this second message because this first thread broke in the middle of execution. Now also, as you saw before, semaphores and mutexes are similar in functionality, so the same thing could apply for semaphores as well. Now we cannot talk about multi-threading without also mentioning synchronization. What if we wanted thread one and thread two to reach some point at the same time? Well. We can achieve that by using a mutex and by blocking each thread if the other one hasn't reached that point. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, let's have the mutexes set to zero. So I'm just going to say mutex one dot lock and mutex two dot lock. Okay. Now that both of these mutexes are locked, we can now block these threads depending on the other one's state. So the first thread, is not going to continue if the second one hasn't finished. So if we want to say that, we just say mutex two dot lock. Now the second thread should not move forward if the first thread is not here. So let's just say mutex one dot lock. Okay, now when do we signal that thread one is here? Well, at this point we could say, hey, thread one is here, or maybe we could do some computation, some stuff. And afterwards we could say, okay, thread one finished its computation and it is here. So basically thread one will say mutex one dot unlock. By unlocking the mutex one, it will allow the second thread to move forward and continue its execution from that point on. Now in the same way, because we want both of these threads to start at the same time, we should also apply the same thing to our second thread. So for example, what I could do is write mutex two dot unlock. So right now we reached the point at which we can announce thread one that it can continue working. So this blocking region will be unblocked and thread one will be able to move forward. Now let us check that this is working by simulating some work for thread two. So let's just say maybe var i equals zero while i is less than, I don't know, 10 million or something, i plus equals to one. Now, finally, we want to write a message here. So print, we are in thread one and write a message here at the end, print, we are in thread two. Now, just for a second, let us remove these 
rendezvous meeting and let's just run it as it is. If I run it, you see I get the we are in thread one message and we are in thread two message, but a bit later. So let me just correct this and I will run it again and watch closely at the delay here. You see thread one first and thread one second, but we do not want that. We want to synchronize these and we want them to reach this print message at the same time. So in order to do that, I am simply going to apply this code and apply this code here as well. And if I run it right now, nothing happens. And then both of them appear at the same time. Now, just to enhance your understanding, let's visualize how this might work. So let's just say that we have a meeting point here. It's a barrier and both thread one and thread two start at the same time. Now for the code of thread one, mutex1.unlock is basically thread one announcing that it had arrived. So thread one has arrived here. Now with this line of mutex2.lock, our thread cannot move forward because it is waiting for the second mutex to be unlocked. So it's basically waiting for the second thread to announce its presence as well. Now our second thread took some time to execute the code and that's why it is not here yet. But after some time, the second thread will also reach this point and it will announce that it has arrived. Now, if the second thread announced that it has arrived, this second lock is going to be opened. So thread one can move forward. Now, in the same way, this first lock has been opened even before the second thread arrived. So this lock is going to be opened as well. And thread two is going to be able to move again. So as you can see, even though thread two took longer to reach this point, both thread one and thread two finished at the same time. Okay, but this synchronization does not apply only for two threads. We could synchronize as many threads as we wanted with semaphores. So if we have a semaphore, which we call barrier, we can basically just lift this barrier up to allow everyone to pass once everyone is at the same spot. Now, I would honestly urge you to try this yourself because you already have all the knowledge that's needed in order to achieve this. So if you want to pause the video, do it now or just stay in for the solution. So in this ready function, I am just instantiating these threads because there are already too many. So I'm doing it with a four. And afterwards, for each thread, I am starting this meeting function to which I bind the current thread number. Okay, now what is this meeting going to do? Well, we want to only pass or to only lift the barrier when all the threads are here. So let's use this count variable to count how many threads have passed. Well, we could just do count plus equals to one. So if a thread calls this function, we increase the count. Now, what we want to do is to check if this count is equal to the thread count. So if it's thread count, then what we would want would be to lift this barrier. So we are simply going to do barrier dot post. Okay, but as you already know, working with multiple threads over the same global variable is generally ill-advised because of the race conditions that could happen. So what we have to do is to use this mutex, so mutex dot lock to lock the access to this variable. Now we do mutex dot unlock to unlock this access. Okay, now what we have to do is to stop our current thread if the barrier is not lifted. And to do that, we simply have to do barrier dot wait. So now if our current thread reached this point, then we have two cases. We either have lifted the barrier, so this was the last thread, or we haven't lifted the barrier. If we haven't lifted the barrier, barrier dot wait is simply going to stop the execution of the thread. But if we did lift the barrier, barrier.wait is going to allow the thread to move forward and then it's going to decrease the barrier again. Now, this is a very important thing to observe because we want all our threads to pass, not only the first one. So after the thread passes, it should also open the barrier for the next thread. So it should do something like barrier.post. Okay. Now, if we want to simulate some work for, let's say, the third thread, we could do something like if 
e equals to 3. Let's say again that we declare a variable var j which equals to 0 and while j is smaller than 1 billion or something we make j equal to j plus 1. Now the third thread is going to take some time but if we did everything right then the other threads should finish at the same time with the third thread. And now in order to see that let's just also print thread number string of I don't know I has arrived. Okay now if you press F5 nothing happens and then all of a sudden all threads appear at once. So I will run it again. See nothing happens then everything finishes. And it's not necessarily the third thread last. You see the third thread could be second, could be fourth, could be anything because these things actually happen at the same time, even if we waited for the third thread. Now, before you leave, I just want to thank HP 95 LX DLC for being a monthly subscriber on my coffee. Now, if you also want to support me, the only thing I ask is to pay for only what you're comfortable with. Honestly, just you being here is more than enough and I'm very grateful for that. So, that being said, thanks for watching and see you in the next one.